All right, and we are now recording. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the latest installment of the Aperio Teaching and Learning Meeting. Today is Wednesday, March the 4th. My name is Matt Burgess. I'm from the University of Virginia, and I'll be facilitating our discussion today. Um, I know we typically start with some welcome and some announcements, uh, many of which often come from our amazing Sakai Community Coordinator, Wilma Hodges, who is on the call with us today. So Wilma, do you want to take us through the announcements that you have to get us started? Sure, and hopefully you can hear me over my dog who just started barking, <laughs> so apologies for that. Um, the uh, the Atlas call for proposals is currently open. It's open through March 30th, and I know that the Atlas committee um, is really hoping to keep that as a, a firm deadline, so they're not looking to extend it. Um, so I do encourage you, if you know any folks on campus that are doing some great stuff in their courses, um, encourage them to apply. Um, the submission form has been streamlined a little bit. We've kind of tried to, you know, consolidate it, make it a little bit easier of an application. So um, there's two links there to a couple different forms. There's one for the course and project application and another one for the portfolio project application. So um, this could be a course or it could be a portfolio or it could be some combination of a Perio tools. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a Sakai course, although a lot of them um, tend to be. Um, so please do encourage folks um, that you know that are doing good things in their courses or um, programs to go ahead and apply for that. Um, and Terry Golightly is the Atlas chair this year, so you can reach out to her if you have any additional questions. Um, and I see Terry's on the call. Terry, did you want to add anything? I, I think you got it. Okay, and, um, except, you know, remind people how good this looks on their resume and, and, and at the back of the catalog that they're an Atlas award a winner, for, award winner for innovative teaching. And, you know, that, that looks really good. Uh, promote the self promotion. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. That's a great point. Um, the other thing, uh, along with the Atlas Awards, is they will be recognized at Open Aperio. And that's my second announcement, is that the Open Aperio program is out there. If you have not seen it already, the program's a little different this year. Um, so it's it's not kind of what we've been accustomed to in terms of the, the way the days are structured. So it, it should be a little different. Um, and registration is currently open. So I've included a couple links there, one to the program, the other one to registration. Um, and I will note that the conference committee, in light of a lot of the recent conference cancellations, like um, Educause ELI, which was sort of very, very last minute, um, and other, you know, events that are kind of up in the air, we are, we're currently exploring options for virtual attendance as an alternative. So um, no, you know, official word yet on, on you know, that, but currently um, that we're looking into it. So um, we're definitely going to have a fallback um, if for whatever reason the in-person um, gathering is, is not deemed the most wise thing to do or if people just don't feel comfortable traveling that they would have another alternative for attending. And that's it for my announcements. Oh, oh, one other one. I forgot to put it on there. Um, RC01 was released yesterday. So we cut the branch for RC01 for Sakai 20. Um, so that's kind of a milestone. I sent out a, an email um, to the email list to let folks know about that. Um, so that uh, begins kind of the, the final phase of the QA process. We usually have three RC01s. So once we get to this point, um, we're just sort of focusing on those blocker bugs and making sure that everything's resolved. We usually go through um, three release candidates before the general release. So, um, so we're at that milestone right now, which is good news. And Josh comments in the chat, way to bury the lead, <laughs> which is very exciting. I was very excited to see that email. Yeah, I'm sorry, I almost forgot. I got distracted with my my links for Atlas and <laughs> <Open> <laughs> <Aperio>. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. 
<laughs> no worries. And as Josh follows up in the chat, RCO one is definitely a big milestone and kudos to all the folks who were working really hard to get us to this point, especially those folks who are really involved in QA. Uh, thank you all so much for all the hard work that you did and continue to do uh, to keep these releases coming out. Sean asked in the chat, Wilma, about any idea on a maintenance release for 19.4. Do you have any thoughts about that or information about that at this point? Yeah, I know that there are plans to release a 19.4 soon, but there hasn't been um, a target date specifically set yet. But there are quite a lot of um, fixes that are available, and, and we'd like to package those into a, a .4. Um, but I don't have an exact date on that. I just know soon. <laughs> so that's about as specific as I can be right now. And Josh comments in the chat that Earl is on the call, and perhaps he had thoughts to add. So Earl, if you have any additional thoughts about that and you want to take a second and share those with us, you're welcome to do so. Okay. And Earl comments that Wilma hit it on the head. So that sounds great. Thank you all very much for that info. Any other announcements from any other project leads or anybody else who has information that they want to share with the rest of us? Any other announcements or thoughts? I'll wait just a second for folks to come on the mic or to post them in the chat here. Okay, seeing none, let's go ahead and move on to the JIRA review portion of our meeting today. We have three different JIRAs that folks requested that we discuss here in the teaching and learning group today. And so I'm going to post the link to the first of those JIRAs here in the chat. Uh, this is SAC 41821, um, a feature request to add a new uh, confirmed submission page uh, to the assignments tool. And I believe that Laura Sierra had requested that we talk about this. So Laura, if you have a second, do you want to come on the mic and maybe tell us a little bit about this one and share your thoughts with us? Sure, thanks. Uh, well, I think the update is that um, since, since we couldn't really um, figure out a good way for this thing to really work uh, and mostly felt that it was actually more of a bad uh, addition than, than anything else, um, it's been backed out, I believe, um, of 20 so far, Earl, is that right? I think that's what I heard yesterday. Um, so we've, we've taken it out and we will discuss it as a community, how we wanna go forward. We couldn't really get to the bottom of why it was added in the first place. Um, so since we didn't really have any, any reason for it to be there, we just backed it out. So we'll revisit it, I think, probably in the next few weeks to see if we want to have something like that back in again or try to figure out why we added it in the first place. But it's kind of a non-issue at this point. Lots has happened in the last week. <laughs> Stay <laughs> tuned, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for that update, Laura. And I do yeah. see some comments here in the JIRA from Tiffany and from Alan Regan just asking for some additional context for this feature and uh, asking for some additional info and sharing some additional thoughts. Earl, did you want to add anything else for this one? Yeah, just real quick. Um, I just I just wanted to just add that um, th this particular feature came in from um, um, a particular client uh, of ours um, from um, Learner's Edge. And they, um, you know, they were pretty uh, happy with, um, you know, uh, the way that it was done. Um, they, they mostly requested two pieces to this, right, which was a, uh, a progress bar uh, for only for the student view. So it is only in the student view. The instructor would never see the progress bar. Um, and then the, um, the other piece to this was a, um, to make the submission screen more like Samago, right? Um, maybe I've heard some of the comments that have gone around that really maybe the Samago screen should be uh, or submissions should be more like assignments instead. And I think that's what people were kind of gravitating toward. Um, but I do want to say that simply that um, um, that this particular feature followed all of the process and all the rules and guidelines that we set forth. There was nothing like some people said, why did this get in? 
It went in just like any other feature that any other client asked us for. And also this feature was actually presented at virtual conference. So um, there was, it, it's been out there for, for quite some time uh, to be vetted. Um, while I agree with some people, it could be questionable, you know, the approach about whether it should look more like Samago or whether Samago should look more like assignments. Um, but, um, you know, just keep in mind that this is a, you know, a feature that came in from someone that where they saw some inconsistency in Sakai and they just wanted to make that better. That was their intention, right? So please remember that, you know, um, sometimes not every feature turns out the way that, um, in the best way possible, right? And some, and I agree that there's been, you know, some issues, you know, with uh, the status not showing correctly. All those are just bugs and they usually can generally be fixed. Um, but just remember that uh, the, the, the requester of this had absolutely good intentions. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I appreciate what you're saying, Earl, because I was one of the QAers who came upon this issue. And, and I have to say that um, maybe it's, you know, it's my fault. It's our fault as a community for, um, you know, we get to choose our level of involvement. And that's that's really great thing about open source is, is we don't have to be in on every little thing. And and so I never I never came a, across this until I was doing QA. And um, when I realized and I didn't even know that that um, if you think about it, when a student submits a quiz, they're actually hitting the submit button twice. I, I never thought of that until this change came into assignments and I was required as a student to hit the submit button twice. And, and so for me, that was like a horrible regression to a, a past usability state. And then I encountered the bug in the status where as a student, I've clicked once to, I've clicked a button that says submit once. And then I discovered that my it didn't save my draft and it didn't actually submit my my assignment. But now I'm presented with a screen that tells me what my status is. And that's a good thing, except there's a bug there. And the my status says not started. So it's kind of like I uploaded my thing and I hit submit. And now you're telling me I still haven't started this assignment. So it is a good thing. Um, the the whole feature is a good thing, but those those little behaviors there have to be streamlined. You know, we have to we have to talk about it as a community. You know, do you do is the button labeled correctly? These are like little usability things, and they don't detract at all from from the grander scheme of thing or or the intention of the people who put it in. And, and so I think the takeaway on this for me was when we do see something like this, we have to we have to remember it's um, it's a new feature and uh, we can we can comment on the feature and maybe how we'd like it to work, but we shouldn't ever detract from the fact that somebody had really good intentions and was trying, especially if you're someone who doesn't engage that often. <laughs> so thanks for listening. Definitely. Well, Our biggest concern was just that it would be confusing to the student if it didn't actually behave like tests and quizzes, where when they click submit the first time, it actually does save their entry this was behaving differently than it wasn't saving their entry so that it was just a little confusing and probably could yeah. have been tweaked and left in frankly i um, i don't I, think it's been removed know? yet i think it's oh, okay. still there okay i even in 20 um i so, just checked and i didn't see oh, it good. i have okay. not seen it removed from 20 yet okay but i agree with all your comments here these are all likely like you know bugs that could be you know fixed um but you're absolutely right that there is a question of whether you know, um, um, you know, m imagine if all these bugs could be fixed, you know, do we still answer the question? Should we keep it for 20 or should we not? And that's, those are all great questions and we should all answer those. So, yeah. Or at so, least I'll participate in answering them is what I mean. So this is Tiffany. Um, what concerned me the most about this ticket is that it introduces a major usability change that in, in, 
some cases may not be very good for students. Um, and it was asked in the comments from the outset that it be brought before TNL and and UX. And it looked like none of that process was ever ever took place. Now, I don't know, maybe I just missed the meeting where it happened, but as far as I can tell, um, neither group took a look at this. And I think um, I think it's an important thing when you have a major workflow change like this uh, to um, to bring it before groups that are dealing with the user side of it. Um, so the, the first comment that Sean made on the ticket, I think probably before even opening it, was you should probably take this to, to TNL um, and UX. Um, so th that was one thing that really concerned me about it. The other thing is that tests and quizzes has a very good reason for having two submit pages, and that's an accessibility issue. So in the WCAG spec, um, in order for you to have a form submission, there's there's certain amounts of error correction that the user has to have, um, you know, the ability to fix their errors before they submit something like a test. And tests and quizzes has a multi-page format, assuming the user uses the, the um, recommended setting of one question per page. So by the time the student gets to that submit page, they have to go back through all the previous pages and look at their answers if they want to check for errors. Uh, assignments is on one page. The submission for assignments is a single page. So you don't have as much of that, you know, potential concern for inability to correct errors uh, when it's all in one place and the submit button's in the same place as the content of the submission. So I think there's a precedent for having some difference there. Um, I would prefer it to be all on one page, like a maybe a modal if that can be made accessible of, are you sure you want to submit? Make sure you go back and check your answers first. Um, but um, I don't think it's, it's as necessary for assignments as it is for quizzes, especially because the instructor has the ability to allow a student to modify an existing assignment submission with the resubmission option. Um, a retake for a test does not allow the student to modify existing content. They only allow them to retake the entire thing from scratch. Thanks for sharing that info with us, Tiffany. I think that's some really helpful context to show some places where tests and quizzes and assignments are similar and some places where they may need to be different uh, just for various technical and accessibility and other reasons. I think as you point out in one of the comments that you left here in this JIRA, too many clicks is a very common complaint about Sakai. And so, you know, that's definitely one of the things that we want to think about going forward. And as Laura Sierra notes uh, in the chat here, you know, there are no TL or UX notes in the ticket. And I do think this year it could be, you know, an important reminder to us that, you know, when we make changes like this and when we want to move them into an environment like Master where everybody's going to see them, even though these changes are always made with the best intentions, I think that's one of the reasons why these groups that we have here in the community like UX and like TNL exist, uh, so that we can, you know, provide some additional feedback and, and some additional thoughts about those. So uh, we want to um, make sure that we discuss them and we want to make sure that we put our notes in um, if we do discuss them, because occasionally that happens as well. One thing to note also um, about uh, bringing it to, to both of those groups is unless there's like a person to kind of advocate for putting that specific JIRA on the agenda, just putting the label on it in JIRA doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get to it because, um, you know, both groups have quite a backlog of JIRAs out there with UX or TNL labels. So um, if there's something that people think really needs eyes on it um, so that it doesn't move forward, I would encourage you to, to you know, post the, a message on the listserv to call people's attention to it there so that if we don't actually get to it during one of the teaching and learning calls, um, that at least people have an opportunity to provide some feedback. Or yeah, try definitely. to attend it and, and, uh, and advocate for it. Yes, certainly if it's a, it's a big, if it's a big concern for your university or if it's something that is really important to you, um, 
yeah, add the notes in the JIRA and then try to attend the meeting so you can advocate for it. You don't even have to stay the whole time, but if you let the folks know that it's uh, kind of important, they're always, always happy to, to lead with that one, so. Yeah, one last note too. Um, this is listed as a feature request. It's very, very simple to create in JIRA a query to uh, just query feature requests for 20. Um, so I would suggest, you know, UX and TNL, if they're if they want to make sure that they're covering uh, new features, getting into the next release, and wanting to, you know, um, just take a quick look at those. Um, just simply create a query to say, show me new features that have, that for this version. And um, and then, you know, I'm not saying, you know, you have to, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, you know, not not use your labels, but I'm just saying, like, use Jira to, to kind of um, at least see what's there. Right. And there aren't that really like a, a huge, like unwieldy number. Um, I think it's probably like um, under 50 for 20. So someone could easily, you know, be scanning those and just seeing if there's anything of import, you know. That's a great idea, Earl. Thanks for sharing that. I think that's definitely something that we may want to do going forward. Josh is asking in the chat whether there's ever any triage of the TNL Jira backlog. Um, and the answer, as far as I know, Josh, is that you know, occasionally we will go through those in preparation for a Jira Palooza or something like that, but that doesn't always happen regularly. So maybe this is also a reminder to us to try to cull through those um, a little bit more regularly if we can do so, maybe in the context of Jira Palooza prep or something like that. Uh, Tricia is suggesting if we can summarize the decisions made uh, in this Jira, which I think is a great idea. Um, and Laura Geckler. Uh, is suggesting that the changes in order to accept this feature would be, number one, uh, the status should be something other than not started, uh, such as ready to submit. And then one of those submit buttons there should have another label. Do people agree with that? Are people in agreement with that, generally speaking? Um, I think it also needs some accessibility uh, testing and verification because the color contrast on that progress bar is not adequate and I'm pretty sure there's gonna be some other problems with it. That's I'm right. writing that in a note on the JIRA itself, accessibility testing needed to include contrast of progress bar. Yeah, I put I included in the comment in one, I don't know if it was this ticket or the other related ticket, um, some of the issues also with there's like a, a an oscillating animation um, it's like an animated gif or something on that progress bar that um, should also be removed because that can cause um, distraction and issues for students with disabilities i see that on your last comment here i'll re reiterate that your last comment on that particular um jira thank you and Laura Sierra is suggesting that the first click should save the draft for the student. Do people um, agree with that as well? Absolutely. Yeah, if we're truly mimicking what uh, Tess and Quizzes does, then it should save it for them. And we're seeing a bunch of plus ones in the chat. So Laura Geckler, if you could add that to our notes as well, that would be wonderful, that that first click should save the draft for the student. I think you know anything that that they're clicking that seems like it might submit or save or perform any action um, like that should save. Uh, that's what it does in tests and quizzes. All the navigation buttons save. Got it. All right. Any other thoughts about SAC four one eight two one before we move on to the next year in the list here? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to post the link to the next JIRA here in the chat. This is SAC 43230. Um, 
uh, Samago Jira uh, about calculated question statistics, um, suggesting that those statistics are wrong if a student who submits the quiz fails to actually answer a question containing the statistics. I see some comments here uh, from Laura Geckler and also uh, from Tiffany. Laura Geckler, do you want to get us started? Because I think you were the one who actually uh, flagged this one and suggested it to us for some review. So do you want to get us started here? Oh, let's see. That was a while ago. Um, 43230? 43230, yes, ma'am. Uh, that was reported by Tiffany. Calculated I mean, stats are wrong. Yeah, I can give you some context for this, uh, if it's helpful. Yeah, yeah, my question here for you, Tiffany, before, I guess, well, you you answered there, but I I don't know what we decided to do on how so, to mark null answers. So let me explain. There's a difference between a null answer at the test level or a null answer for a um, short answer essay question, and and how the stats handles null answers for auto graded questions. So the quiz stats will give the instructor a list. Per, on a per question basis of how many students answered that question specifically. And null answers in that are not taken into account because you don't want it to say seven students answered this question when only five of them did, right? So for the individual question stats, and this is one question type, calculated question type, that is not reporting these stats correctly. All the other question types are reporting them correctly. What it's question doing, type. what? Which question type? Calculated, the calculated okay. question question okay. type. So the calculated question, what it's doing is it's it's correctly saying how many students responded. So it'll say, you know, there, there are three responses. It'll say this, there are three responses. The problem part is the percent answered correctly. So each question underneath it gives you the answer options, whether they're correct, whether that answer option is correct or not and the number of responses that were made correct or incorrect, right? Um, so at the bottom where it says how many responses there were to the question, it also says how many responses out of those, what percentage answered correctly? And the problem with this is that right now, it's taking the, it's dividing the answered correctly out of the number of responses to the assessment and not the number of responses to the question. So it says three responses, 50% answered correctly. Um, but that's not possible, right? Um, but in fact, four students submitted my quiz. So there are three responses, two of which are correct. It should say 66% correct. But in this case, it's taking one out of, uh, one out of, uh, two out of four, excuse me, 50% answer correctly, two out of four answers instead of two out of three. You see what I'm saying? Got it. Rather than make a comment on this, I think the comments that you've made here before are the same that you just gave us. Yeah. And that this has just been waiting to be opened. So I'm going to go ahead and open it unless there's disagreement on the call. And Tiffany, it's your understanding that every other question type behaves in the opposite way. Is that correct? Well, that those those percentages are calculated based on the number of students who answered the question as opposed to the number of students who submitted the assessment. Is that right? Yes, that is right. And I have gone through all of those question types extensively recently, <laughs> analyzing the updates to statistics that are going to be going in. Um, yeah, this is... Um, it's just the percentage that's wrong, so it's actually showing you the right number of responses, but the percent answered correctly is being divided out of the wrong value in the database. I agree, that's a bug. It should be consistent across all the, the question types, so I don't think we need any more discussion. Done, it's open. Let's find a developer to fix this and so it won't be a bug in 20. Thanks, everybody. Sounds good. Thank you all very much. 
And Laura Sierra comments in the chat. Thank you, Tiffany, for really looking at these tests and quizzes, stats and grading issues. Yes, Tiffany, this is often a very thankless job. And so thank you very much for being the one who is great enough or crazy enough to wade into Samago and deal with all that stuff. So thank you for taking the time to do that and then explain them all to us because we don't want to deal with it. So you are very generous in your time to be able to do that for us. What's your favorite gift card? I feel like we should send you something like Raid, you know, so, some kind the of bugs. killer, exactly, <laughs> some kind of insecticide. They might not let us mail that to people, so that might not work. I can get you a gift card for Raid. <laughs> I love that idea, Lord. I love that idea. Target gift cards for Raid to Tiffany Stoll. I love it. All right, I'm going to post the link to our third and final JIRA here in the chat. And this is SAC 43308, um, recommending that the accept until date in the assignments tool should autofill with the due date when creating a new assignment. Laura Sierra, I think you were the reporter for this one. Uh, do you want to walk us through your thoughts on this one? Yeah, thanks. So this is... Um... Matt, and Matt Jones has commented on this too, so there's probably a couple of things that we want to look at on this. Um, number one, because except until date, which is, allows the instructor to um, have a later or give them a little more time to turn in their work, but it would still be, it would be marked as late. Um, because it's required, I, I've had a number of people run into this and, and not realize that um, it's auto-filled with one day after the due date. It's just automatically autofilled and it is a required field right now. So I have a lot of instructors who aren't, don't realize that that's happening. I, for whatever reason, they're more concerned about the, you know, what they're telling students to do than when the due date is, I guess. Um, so I was just suggesting that it not autofill with a day in advance, that it just simply autofill with the due date. And if you want to adjust it to give them more time, you can, or um, maybe we don't have the accept until date be required. And, you know, I, this is the discussion I think that we have to have is what kind of behavior do we want this to be, to have? And then Matt Jones brings up a good point of let's talk then about, I also kind of said something in another JIRA about some of the descriptions, like the description under the accept until date um, field says assignment cannot be submitted after the close date. And that's the first time the term close date has come up because it doesn't appear anywhere else in the settings. So I wasn't sure what that was even referring to. It is tucked up under the accept until date. So I think I would assume it's the latest date. So there's a couple of issues here. One, probably three issues. One, do we want accept until date to be a required field? Two, if it is required, do we want it to automatically fill with the due date itself or some other, some other number? And three, um, what words should we be using consistently throughout Sakai to describe these dates? Because they're different in different tools and that can be confusing to instructors. So um, the previous behavior, to the best of my knowledge, at least as far as I've seen, uh, is that the accept until date pre-fills with the same date as the due date. And then the instructor can adjust it as needed. Um, I disagree with Matt Jones's comment that you'd always want to sync the dates to force the accept until date to, to match the due date if the user changes the due date. Um, current behavior is if they change the due date and forget to change the accept until date, they get a message saying, hey, you got to make your accept until date later than your due date, and then they can post it after they change it. Um, and I think that behavior is fine. Um, I disagree with that. I disagree with that. There is no reason that we have to make people do something over again. There's no reason that we shouldn't change the accept date. There, there's every reason to keep the accept until date at the same interval from the due date as it was before. So you're going to need some some extra logic in both Assign in every tool that has dates in order to do that. So you're going to need it in assignments. You're going to need it in Samago. You're going to need it in forums. Yes, uh, I think that, whatever that's going to be very, very complicated. Um, the current behavior for anything that has a potential late date is that the late date is not 
forced to change when the instructor changes the due date. And I think that it shouldn't be forced to change because if somebody sets the accept until date two weeks from now, uh, they may not want it two weeks from the new due date if they extend the due date. You know, I don't think that number should be changing without the user's knowledge. What uh, happens if no accept date is used? Well, for tests and quizzes, there's actually an option, don't use it, don't accept late. And that automatically in the back end pre-fills the accept until date as the due date. I'd like so, to see something like that in assignments. I think that's pretty yeah. um, easy for instructors to understand. I think if you were able to leave the accept until date blank, you'd have some thinking that it meant indefinite. Well, it does what, it, that's exactly what it means. So if you have a null date anywhere, uh, with the exception of the tests and quizzes date exceptions, which has its own bizarre behavior and I think should be changed, um, the, um, the date being null always means open indefinitely. Yes, I think I agree. I agree with Christina and Tiffany and others that I'm very intrigued by Matt Jones's proposal here to leave that accept until date empty um, unless the instructor chooses to populate that uh, with a date. You know, to me, it seems like that also lowers the number of things that an instructor has to do uh, to set up an assignment. If an instructor just simply wants to accept an assignment until a particular day, it can be a little frustrating to have to fill in an additional field with exactly the same values as what you have in the field above. You know, it's one of those things, again, where Sakai requires you to jump through an additional small hoop um, in order to get your assignment posted and available to your students. And so I think I like that idea of potentially simplifying that workflow for instructors unless they want to make a conscious decision uh, to accept that date. I really like that logic, Matt, and that's kind of what I was trying to go with before. If we knew a value that would be correct 80% of the time, then then we could pre-fill it with that value, a day out, a week out, whatever. But, but to your point, we don't know that value, so why are we pre-filling it with anything, um, thereby asking instructors to do an extra thing? I mean, I think it would be nice if it just had a radio button like tests and quizzes where you can say, are late submissions accepted? Yes, no. If you yeah. say no, then it in the back end without them seeing it or knowing it is automatically filling the close date with the, uh, the same as the due date. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Then they don't have to worry about it. If, if it's not yeah. something they want to have, then they don't worry about it. It's not something they have to click or decide on. That's, I guess, the biggest stumble here is that they're going to trip over it because it's required. Yeah. And it's made a decision already. So they're going to have to interact with it even if they don't want a late date. So as to the, um, the consensus here for um, putting the comment on um, 43308, uh, somebody needs to place the comment and I'm pushing for consensus so we can move the agenda on. I've what do we want to do? Open. Okay, Laura, Sarah, do, what do we think? Do we want to leave except until date blank or do we want to put a check box or you guys were talking about a radio button? <clears throat> I see, it seems to me that the consensus is leaning towards, you know, some sort of minor UI change uh, that would include a checkbox or a radio button to enable accepting late submissions and then at that point, if that checkbox or radio button is enabled to autofill with the due date so that the instructor can then modify that date. So looking at the chat, we're getting some plus ones. Terry, thank you. Christina, thank you. Adrian suggests maybe having a UX group look on how that checkbox, radio button, whatever is actually put on the screen. Heather's got a plus one as well. Uh, so I think we are going that way, Laura, Sarah, our note taker. All right, and reminder oh, that right after this call, we'll probably talk about this in the UX call. So stay tuned. That's perfect. So we encourage folks to head over to the UX call as soon as we are finished here today and carry this conversation forward and push this one along. Because I think this could be 
um, a nice little enhancement for instructors that will maybe simplify uh, that assignment's workflow and make it a little bit uh, more discernible for them. So thanks everybody for taking the time to walk through all three of these, um, but especially uh, this third one here. Any other woot. thoughts or comments before we move on? Laura Geckler. Woot woot. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. That was important to add, so thank you. All right, seeing none, uh, let's take a few minutes here and dive into some preliminary discussion um, about some analytics options going forward in Sakai. This was obviously something that came up um, in a significant way at Sakai Camp. For those of you who were able to be at Sakai Camp, you know, analytics was one of the things uh, that we started diving into there. It's obviously something that I think is going to be a huge point of emphasis uh, for instructors and administrators and even students. Um, in LMS systems and other ed tech tools going forward. And so I think this is something that we wanna start thinking about um, in an even more serious way uh, here in Sakai as other tools are doing as well. And so I know we've got a number of folks uh, who are community leaders and who are project leads or team leads who are here on the call. And so I know many of you have started to think about analytics and have started to brainstorm things uh, that you wanna see available or maybe things that you've seen uh, showing up in other tools. Um, Josh, I know you're here on the call. I know you've started to think about these things. Uh, Wilma, I know you've started to think about these things. Josh, do you want to kind of get us started here with some of the thoughts that you've been thinking about as you all been brainstorming analytics at Longsite? Um, you know, so from, from my perspective, I've been trying to facilitate these conversations and I've been less focused on the, the, the functional aspects of what the uh, you know what the particular instructional analytics ought to be. I mean, I I tend to view them in two buckets. You know, one is program level analytics, so the the stuff that needs to get reported to uh, directors of programs and deans and other academic administration, um, and that helps with uh, with accreditation. And then on the other side, there's there's the instructional analytics that helps faculty members know whether they're teaching effectively. You know, and there's probably also the variant of uh, student-facing analytics that helps students figure out whether they're on track, whether they're doing well. I mean, so that's that's kind of the way I see it. I mean, Wilma, I wonder if you have things that you think ought to go in each of the, in the sort of instructional faculty-facing bucket and the, the student-facing bucket. Well, I think um, for the faculty um, view, they would probably be more interested in things that kind of show the overall progress of the class, um, kind of an overview of a student's progress in the course, a particular student, um, as opposed to a summary of everyone. And then, um, you know, things that would be sort of um, reminders or red flags where they might want to intervene to help somebody along. So those are the kinds of things that I would imagine faculty would be looking for in analytics. Um, as far as students go, um, students really care about just kind of keeping up to date. They want to know what's coming up next, um, you know, what things they have due. They want to know, you know, when they have competing deadlines, if there's a, a time in the semester where they're going to have like five different exams within a week, you know, maybe th those um, potential areas need to be flagged to them in some way to help them manage their time. So, um, so those are just kind of my general thoughts, but I'm really interested to hear from you guys um, what you think, what kinds of questions would you be asking as an instructor? Um, because the questions are really going to drive, you know, what's the best way to visualize that data? No, no, not as an instructor. Let's or narrow a student. the scope. Let's yeah. narrow the scope. The scope on our, on our agenda here is narrowed to students. What do students statistics for students. At least I understood it to be, what do students need to see? Do we want to talk broader than that or do we just want to grab onto that student part? Well, we can certainly limit to students. Um, Josh kind of covered all three, so I was doing the broad approach. <laughs> but I, I definitely am in favor for limiting our scope because we have limited time. So I mean, if we want to just focus today. Students brainstorming, so I'm yeah. you know, scoping yeah. is good. Yeah. So I think one of the main things that students want to be able to do is get 
quickly to the points where they haven't done the work yet, right? So we've gotten questions from students where they've said, my instructor requires me to post once in forums per week and reply to two posts. How do I know which ones I've, you know, whether I've posted and whether I've replied? And the instructor has access to that information currently. They have the statistics and grading screen where they can go and click a link on each student's thing to, to each of their posts and to each of their replies and see all that in one place. If that could be exposed to students, that would be great because you know that would get them a direct link to all of their posts. That would get them, you know, can I have I done my work this week? Um, and I think the same thing is true of other tools, you know, that they want to know, do I have something this week that I haven't done yet? And can I get quickly to the things, you know, can I see all of my assignments that have feedback given to me in one place and can I get to them quickly? That's excellent. I like that. I That's think what one I want to know as a student. I think one thing that um, that has not been addressed is the last day of attendance as a Title IV requirement because legally in order to maintain things like financial aid and that kind of thing, do online students have to demonstrate that they have participated actively in a course at least once a week. And if the student can log on and say, oh, I was in here last Thursday and here it is Wednesday. It's a good thing I'm in here and I'm on time because they, uh, the institution is responsible for assuring that students in online are participating actively at least once a week. And we're not really tracking or exposing that kind of attendance as a default anywhere that they can say, this is, you know, I was here six days ago or I was, oh, it's only been a day and a half or whatever. Um, I think that that would help satisfy a legal requirement for the Title IV financial aid stuff. Should we read, uh, should we change the last log, log on to be last activity or last participation? We don't have that information exposed at all. Okay. Yeah, I think um, it would be helpful in that case to have sort of on a, a, a page where the student could go on a per course basis and say, you know, and basically see their site stats activity. You know, I viewed resources on this date and I viewed this lesson page on this date. Um, I think really a, a one stop shop kind of location, if that's possible to access all of this information would be best if it, you know, I mean, that would be more complicated than doing it on a per site basis. But, um, you know, as a student, if I have uh, sites that my instructors have set up lesson pages on and I can only access assignments through those lesson pages, I can't go to assignments and see that overview of, here's the ones I've completed, here's the ones that are due soon and so on. Could that be part of the synoptic tool in the overview, overview page? I don't know that instructors would want another tool appearing in the overview page. Sometimes instructors want to turn off synoptic tools because they're invasive and cause the page to squish. You know, if they're yeah. using a large uh, layout, I think that adding things on the on the overview is also sort of cramping the instructor's style potentially. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's more it's for the home site. Speed. Yeah, home site. Which is really cool because not every LMS has a home site place. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, you, and my, my workspace. Yeah. My yeah, workspace. yeah. Right. Yeah. That's right. And I think I that's definitely that something. If it has all the courses in one place, it also needs a way to filter to show just one. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, kind of like search to let you filter um, or search by site. Yeah, I mean, we're already doing, we're, I mean, we're already doing chunks of this, aren't we? So we've got, I mean, the bullhorns and site stats, they're kind of working in that way. All they're, all they're doing is literally listening for events from all the various tools and taking action on those events, like storing something in the DB, presenting a message or whatever, right? So we have like reams of information going past all the time, events from tools, actions students have taken. So we have the data 
the, the data's there. I mean, the, the the place the place where these these kind of conversations always seems to stall for me is just, you know, coming to a decision about what reports we want, what we want to do, what's 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 really pertinent, you know, like to, to put in like a student dashboard type thing. But the mechanisms are tested, the data's going past already. So, you know, a, a big chunk of that stuff is already in place. We just need to utilize it better. So I thought that the dashboard was a really cool idea when that was being looked into, but the major problem with it were permissions. So it was exposing data to students like um, resources in folders that were hidden but allowed access to contents, um, you know, stuff like that, that students shouldn't be able to access um, when the instructor has put restriction, certain restrictions on them. Yeah, you've got to be careful. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, the bullhorns co code is a bit like that as well. I mean, you, you know, I've had to. You, you've, you have got to be. You have got to be careful when you're consuming these events to make sure that um, you know the person you're presenting it to has has got the permissions to see it. Now, that's just something you've got to be aware of. But we look. I mean, we're looking. We're looking at various things around this area. For instance, uh, we're looking at doing an achievement service this year. So. The achievement service will like be a centralized place where we can do things like in lessons say you can only view this lessons page if you view these other two right so the other two are prerequisites well we'd move that into this centralized way of describing what a prerequisite is for an action we could also use something like that to describe say a student has to do two forum posts before they've you know engaged with the forum or whatever right so a few of these things are kind of they're in, they're in their kind of like birthing stages, but but we are kind of looking at stuff like that. So this is an interesting conversation. And I think that's a great point that you just made, Adrian. That a lot of this data is already there and is already being passed through, and we already have a good location in home, my workspace, where you know some of that data could potentially be aggregated and displayed. And so, really, we have a lot of the back end pieces that could answer some of the questions that we are getting from faculty, staff, and students already. And we just need to combine some of those back end pieces with some front end pieces that leverage that information in the best possible way. I think that gets back to the question that Josh asked in the chat, um, the question that they heard from students at Providence um, when Longsight was there, which was how on track am I across my various courses? And when students think about that, they usually ask a single question there instead of asking a series of questions, how on track am I in this course? How on track am I in this course? How on track am I in this course? They think about what do I need to do for school this week? And unlike a lot of systems, um, as both Adrian and Laura Geckler have pointed out here, you know, Sakai has a place uh, that kind of breaks you out of that very modular, separate course, separate course, separate course uh, type of silo. And so, you know, we might be able to leverage that uh, to present some of this information there. Um, so I think that gets back to some conversations that we've had at Sakai Camp and elsewhere about, you know, using this information that we already have, supplementing it with some additional information um, to kind of uh, leverage that in a way uh, that could be really meaningful to students to show them everything that they've got to do, um, you know, across everything that they're working on right now. Yeah, well put. <laughs> So it's 10.55. I know we are getting to the end of our time here today, unfortunately, but this has been a great preliminary conversation, and I hope that we will continue this conversation going forward. I think we've kind of laid out you know, some of the basic issues that we've identified here. I think we've identified you know, some of the basic questions that students are asking. I think that was a great thing to note, Josh, because I think that's a great guiding point for us as we continue thinking about this. And maybe the next step um, is to you know, kind of inventory, you know, some of those things uh, that Adrian was talking about, you know, some of these back end things that we already have uh, through bullhorns, um, you know, through the coming achievement service, look at those back end things and then think about you know, how we want uh, those back end things to potentially uh, be displayed to students and where we want that to be displayed, whether we want them to be displayed in that home, my workspace or elsewhere. And Josh is asking in the chat uh, whether a few people might want to create 
uh, that kind of a backend inventory and, and report back at the next meeting or at an upcoming meeting. Um, Adrian, I don't want to sign you up, but I know you have a lot of experience working with that stuff. Is that something that you could get us started with in terms of just kind of helping us understand, you know, what sorts of information are already being passed through, uh, through bullhorns and, and through other services? Yeah, yeah, for sure. No problem. Yeah, put me down for that. That would be awesome. Thank you. And then maybe from there, we can go forward and start thinking about how we're going to surface all this awesome information in a way that just blows students' minds when they <laughs> sign in and take a look at it. <laughs> makes them panic, you mean, when they... <laughs> <laughs> or on the other side, it makes them panic when they realize, oh, crap, yeah. I've got to do They just didn't want to know, you know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. Sometimes ignorance is actually bliss. <laughs> So a couple of quick notes. Um, first, a note about our next meeting, uh, which is two weeks from today on Wednesday, March 18th. Uh, we are going to have a Jirapalooza at that time. Um, so uh, we, the facilitators, will hopefully take some time to kind of go through and triage uh, some of the jurors that are already labeled for TNL so that we can potentially put some of those on the list. Um, if any of you have JIRAs that you'd like to discuss uh, at that time, uh, please feel free uh, to send those uh, to Tricia or to Wilma or to myself um, so that we can dive in and have some more great conversation about all the various things uh, that are being worked on or that could be worked on next uh, in the community. Those Jirapaloozas are really uh, an important time for us to sit down and kind of hash out together how we want Sakai to operate in various important ways. And it's really awesome that we get an opportunity to do that uh, in concert with one another and in concert with our great development team. So please uh, think about that. If you have any JIRAs, feel free to send those our way and please uh, join us for that meeting two weeks from today on Wednesday, March 18th. The final announcement that I have today is that uh, this will be my last call as a teaching and learning group facilitator, uh, at least uh, for the near future. Uh, I have accepted another position here at the university uh, with the university's Center for Teaching Excellence, um, working with uh, their new learning technologies initiative there. So I will still be involved uh, in learning technologies here at UVA and beyond. Um, and I'm hopeful that I'll still be able to be involved uh, with the community in various ways, uh, but just not uh, in the same day-to-day -day way uh, that I've been here with UVA's Sakai team for the last five years. It was a very difficult decision for me uh, in large part because I have enjoyed so much uh, being uh, a day-to-day -day part of the Sakai community and working uh, with all of you and getting to meet many of you uh, either virtually or in person um, for the last five years. And so I'm going to miss uh, not being able to see you all and connect with you all all the time. Uh, but don't worry, I'm not going far. I'm still going to be plugged in. I'm still going to be checking email and diving in as much as I can. And uh, I'll still be hoping to connect with you all either virtually or in person uh, in various ways. So thank you guys for letting me uh, be a part of this community and uh, work with you all and learn so much uh, from all of you over the last several years. So thanks again, everybody, uh, for another great discussion. And we will look forward uh, to seeing all of you uh, here uh, two weeks from today on Wednesday, March 18th, to dive into some more JIRAs. Thanks again, everybody, and uh, have a great day. Bye, Matthew. Happy trails. See you. <laughs> thanks, Laura. See you around.